I want to welcome you all to this open forum organized by the OECD and uh, thank you for walking long distance from the main hall up to uh, this floor of the building to the very far end of this floor. My name is uh, Jörn I am. I have a, a very long career behind me as the Danish telecom regulator. I've been regulator in Denmark for 21 years. Uh, right now I'm chairing the uh, OECD CP committee. I have been doing this since autumn 2009. Um, you may wonder what ICCP stands for. It stands for Information, Computer and Communications Policy. It's very complicated and we are working very hard on finding ways of changing the name to be a little more modern uh, and uh, one idea which seems to gain support from many OECD members is the Committee for the Digital Economy. This sounds more modern. So this is what you can expect. Together with me, I have a what I would consider a dream team of panelists, the best panel of all panels here at the IGF. <laughs> I have to my left Audrey Planck from Intel, where Audrey is doing global security and internet policy as a specialist. Audrey leads global policy efforts on topics such as cybersecurity, critical infrastructure prote protection, encryption, and internet governance. And uh, on top of this, I can inform you that Audrey has done a lot of good work in OECD. Audrey has been helping Anne Kabla. I'll come back to Anne in a moment. To the left of Audrey, we have Joe Alderhef from Oracle. Joe is chairing the Business and Industry Advisory Committee to the OECD, the so-called BIAC, uh, in the area of Internet and ICT policy. Joe is all over the world, all the time where ICT is on the agenda, Joe is there. I think that within the ICT world, nobody has more miles on his account than Joe has. He's, he's flying all the time. And when you want to know about the uh, features of new airplane types, A380, just go to Joe. He can sell every detail, which seat to choose and all that. And on top of this, he's, an, he's a real expert in, in ICT uh, issues, including cybersecurity. To my right, I have Anne Carblanc. Anne is head of division for information, computer, and consumer policy at the OECD Secretariat. And Anne is my principal aide in chairing the ICCP committee. Anne is assisted by Laurent Bernat. He's a policy analyst in the OECD Secretariat, and he's in charge of cyber security issues. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the dream team of IGF 2013. Today's forum here is dedicated to two important OECD policy recommendations, the privacy guidelines and the security guidelines. Before we turn to these two items, just a quick couple of words about the OECD as an organization and the broader context for these recommendations. OECD stands for Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. There was an evil OECD ambassador who once said OECD stands for Organization for Eating, Chatting and Drinking. This is not true, I can assure you. I have been around four years now and I can assure you it is an organization with a lot of professional, very, very competent, good work which is done. People are working very hard in the Secretariat, but also in the committees of OECD. And some very uh, prominent results uh, are uh, coming out of this hard work. Security guidelines, privacy guidelines. I can mention also of interest for this uh, community, the internet policy making principles, which I think are well known all over the world. OECD is an intergovernmental body gathering 34 members, uh, 40, 
34 countries, member countries across the world, North and South America, Latin America, Europe, but also the Asia-Pacific region. OECD comprises uh, developed economies, large economies, but also um, the emerging economies in the develop the developing countries, countries like Mexico and Chile and Turkey, countries with amazing growth rates these years. The objective of OECD is well defined by its name, its economic cooperation and development, and the work is mainly concentrated on helping governments adopt policies which will improve economic and social well-being of people around the world. So this is why the mission statement is better policies for better lives. The OECD operates as an international forum for dialogue and sharing of experience where governments are seeking solutions to common problems and challenges. On top of the organization is the OECD Council. That's where the ambassadors are seated. Underneath in the organizations, there are many, many committees dealing with different issues, trade, education, tax, and agriculture. And the committee which I am chairing is dealing with, as I think I mentioned, the digital economy, internet, ICT policies from the perspective of economic and social development. This is the main perspective, and although this is the main perspective, from time to time, the committee is also dealing with other related issues, human rights, and national security when appropriate. Just a couple of points regarding the broader perspective of the work uh, we are doing. The OECD work on ICT policy, internet policy, uh, has many years of uh, history. Uh, and already in uh, the mid-70s, the OECD identified ICTs as being drivers for productivity and growth. Um, accordingly, the initial privacy guidelines were adopted in 1980, and the first security guidelines came in 1992. So you could say that OECD started very early to work on trust, recognizing that trust is essential to IC, for ICTs to fully realize their economic and social potential. Since the mid-90s, the success of the internet in bringing about economic uh, benefits, bringing about innovation, jobs, and growth has been astounding and has confirmed the vision. Just to remind you about a few facts in that context, when we talk about growth, I would like to use Europe as an example of the enormous growth related to ICTs. In Europe, as an example, 50% of productivity growth can be related to ICTs and the internet, and 25% of the growth of GDP can be related to it the internet. McKinsey carried out a study a couple of years ago stating that internet has created as much growth in the last 15 years that the industrial revolution created in 50 years. 15 years, 50 years. Amazing. And in the past five years, the internet has created 2.6 new jobs for every job displaced by the internet. So the internet is also a job generator. Enormous source of growth, enormous source of innovation, enormous source of new jobs. That is the internet. And all this revolution coming out of the internet mainly has come over the last, say, 20 years. So you could, you could say that the environment in this area has changed dramatically over recent years. And that means that we have to look into the privacy guidelines, which has been created or adopted 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, and the security guidelines, which are from 1992. So let me now turn to the 
panelists, the Dream Team, it's a very timely moment to discuss the issues we have before us, and not because of the challenges raised by the revelations this summer. We all know what I'm talking about, about the scale of national security activities in relation to the Internet. For the OECD, we have just completed the first ever revision of the 19 OECD, 1980 OECD privacy guidelines, which is one of the real landmarks in this space. On the security side, we are now deep into a review of the 2002 guidelines for the security of information systems and networks. So these two instruments, fundamental for trust building, are enjoying deep scrutiny and we welcome the opportunity to open this discussion to the broader IGF community. We would like this forum to be as interactive as possible. We have among us this dream team of four panelists with an extensive knowledge of the OECD and the guidelines. And I will start by asking them questions one by one and then turn to the audience as often as possible to ask for your questions to stimulate a discussion here. So I will stop my long introductory remarks, which became longer than maybe I expected myself, excuse me for that, um, and turn to Anne. And, and I would ask Anne, could you tell us a few words about what an OECD recommendation is in general and why OECD recommendations are useful? What, why do we make OECD recommendations and how do they impact the real world, so to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, in general, OECD recommendations are non-binding instruments. They reflect a consensus of OECD membership on specific issues. They also represent a political commitment to implement uh, them by members. Their characteristics include that the fact that they stem from a multi-stakeholder process where there is consultation and no co-decision, but consultation. The instruments are generally flexible. The OECD respects the different cultures and different styles of governments and legal regimes. And they tend to focus on what works, what drives economic and social um, development. They are not ideological or political in that sense. Finally, they are often pioneering instruments, soft law. Uh, and in the area of privacy and security, we can see that the privacy guidelines inspired many laws around the world and other international instruments. And likewise, the security guidelines inspired the UN security resolution were adopted by APEC and um, ASEAN too. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. Um, and I, I took the last uh, words as a, a, um, a sign that we have seen the reflection of the work in OECD also in bodies outside the OECD. So we can say that also beyond the OECD, the, uh, the uh, thinking behind the recommendations actually is taken on board in, in other organizations in the global uh, community. Yes. I, I would now, now like to turn to you, Joe, and uh, uh, I would like you to elaborate a little bit on uh, what you see as is the value of the guidelines um, for businesses uh, within uh, the OECD countries, but, but also in, in businesses uh, beyond OECD. Thank you. Uh, well, the, the one thing uh, I'll state perhaps to just slightly supplement your opening comments related to the OECD is one of the things that's of value to business and it's important to an organization like the, to a forum like the IGF is that the OECD too, especially in the ICCP, is a multi-stakeholder group. Uh, there are representatives from industry through BIAC, from civil society through CSAC, from the technical community, uh, 
uh, through ITAC and from the trade union community through TURAC, uh, as well as observer countries uh, that are not OECD members. So it's a very inclusive uh, process within the OECD, uh, as well as a very interactive process. So from a business perspective, the guidelines help in two ways. Uh, today, we are situated in a, in a world where there is not global consistency across laws, and we doubt there ever will be global harmonization of laws, especially in things like privacy, because of the fact that while the principles of privacy may be very similar, if you look at the OECD guidelines, if you look at the Council of Europe Treaty 108, if you look at the APEC framework, uh, if you look at the fair information practice principles in the United States, they all draw on very similar principles. But at the level of detail, they adapt to the legal framework and the culture of the society in which they operate. And therein lie the differences. But the OECD that was able to put forth, for instance, the Transborder Data Flows Guidelines, which are called the Privacy Guidelines, helped in many ways bridge across nations to make sure that that uniformity of principles was committed to by countries and respected by them as they were drafting their national laws. And that helps business that by definition operates globally and has to think about how to move data across jurisdictions. It helps create the responsible frameworks on how to manage data as it crosses borders, and hence the focus on transborder data flows. It's also very important to remember that one of the great topics of currency in data protection at the moment is the concept of accountability. And accountability is, in fact, one of the, uh, one of the principles uh, within the OECD guidelines. So it foreshadowed long before it was a topic of currency the importance of the concept of accountability. The last thing is, for those of you who have not had the chance to read the OECD guidelines in a while, I commend very highly to you uh, the explanatory memorandum that went with the data protection guidelines. The explanatory memorandum was a document that was way ahead of its time. In many ways, it foretold many of the issues that we see today, even if it couldn't exactly identify the, the technology that would be used related to them. But even in the terms of the technology, it foresaw some of them as well. Uh, and in fact, that document was so valuable that as we looked at the review of the guidelines, we decided not to revise the document, but rather to supplement it because the document in its original form is a tremendously valuable document for people to think of and to consider, and it allows us to also see the evolution of the concepts and the applications of the solutions over time. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, as I said in my initial remarks, uh, we will be very open for inviting you to uh, give us your comments while we move forward in, in this. And I wonder whether you have any questions at this stage or comments related to the first two uh, interventions. Please go ahead. We also have um, remote participation. And there might be also questions from remote participants, not at this stage. But if there are not questions at this stage. Maybe I should move on then and ask uh, Anne if you could briefly tell us the background for uh, what motivated the OECD to update the privacy guidelines. I have already touched a little bit upon it in my um, introductory remarks. But um, what led to the, the uh, modification? I remember I was I was part of the celebration of the 30th anniversary of the privacy guidelines. And uh, um, everybody talked a lot about that the guidelines were perfect and good work has been done. Why did we do the changes? And, uh, and could you also maybe tell us a little bit about uh, what you consider as the main modifications of the guidelines compared to the, the original ones? Thank you. <clears throat> 30 years without modifications, that's the, the time that the period during which these guidelines lasted. Uh, but eventually, um, ICTs, the internet, the globalization, the change of scale in the world of personal data, P2P, 
play in our economies and daily lives, the volume uh, and global availability of personal data collected and used, the number and variety of actors handling personal data, the value of societal and economic benefits that can be enabled by new personal data users, um, the expanding role of data analytics, the complexity of transactions, and the difficulty for individuals to protect their own privacy, all of this was noted by um, ministers in, in Seoul in 2008, and they called for, for a review. There was then this report and this anniversary that you mentioned, and that was followed by the creation of a, a large volunteer group, which is which was multi-stakeholder and chaired by the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, Jennifer Stoddart. And that group provided a number of um, proposals to the bodies in the OECD as to what changes could be made to the, um, to the guidelines. I would like to note that the OECD is not the only organization which has undergone a process of review of its instrument, the European Commission, the European Union, and the Council of Europe are also conducting these, these exercises. And there are a number of initiatives in the private sector as well. Um, in terms of the, the main modifications of, of the guidelines, um, perhaps the first thing to highlight is that the modernization took uh, a pragmatic approach. There's a focus on pragmatic, practical implementation. And you can see those through two main uh, elements in the guidance. The first one is the risk management approach. This is new, not new to security, but new to privacy. And um, the goal is to determine what are the safeguards which are necessary through to protect personal data through a process that identifies and evaluates the risk to individuals' privacy. And then there is an incident response planning which is needed. And that should, that's in fact an integral part of an effective risk management approach. The second practical um, um, modernization or update <laughs> is the global interoperability, the stress on the global interoperability of privacy frameworks which is needed to deal with the global, globalization uh, of our world and also with the change uh, in scale. We have the safe harbor, which was, I would say, a pioneering instrument in its time. Um, there are other initiatives, one which is promising, and apologies because I'm French and I'm citing a French initiative, but is the initiative by the, the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL, uh, to, to see whether the European Union binding corporate <coughs> rules can usefully interface with the APAC cross-border privacy rules. There are also a number of um, other um, changes, and these are not, um, I would say, trivial. The first one is a call for national, for the development of national privacy strategies. This is something that we don't have in this area. We begin to see that in the security area. But in the privacy area, no. Because privacy has long been seen as either a human right or a consumer right, and as well as a technical issue, an expert issue. When in fact, and in the current context um, that our chair referred to, um, you see that it's really important that governments, at the highest level, in fact, begin to develop national strategies to indicate the main objectives at a national level with respect to the protection of personal data. And there's a need also for cross-department or cross-government coordination. And there is also a need to consult with all stakeholders. So the call for national privacy strategies in the guidelines, to my, at least to my, um, view is not something which is trivial. Other uh, key concepts include uh, privacy management programs for organizations, whether they are public or private. 
data security breach notification, which covers both notice to authorities and notice to the individuals. And there's a new provision which calls for complementary measures, including uh, education, awareness, skills development, and so on. I could perhaps say two more words. And there is an elaboration of what it means to be accountable. There is a modernization and clarification, I would say, of the transborder data flow section. And if you let me say a few more words on those, I think it's important. This time in the revised guidelines, it's clear that among the parties, among the, the members um, who are implementing the guidelines, if there is a respect of the principles and the level of protection, then the transporter flows are free. Of course, you have the exception of the European Union, which still requires and doesn't change its system, but still requires more for adequate protection. But what is also clear is that if you are a country with no law on privacy, you can have organizations providing an equivalent level of protection to the one provided in the guidelines. And in that case, the flow should be free too. Um, something also which is important is the call for establishing privacy enforcement authorities, which was not in the original guidelines. Last word, well, this is an update. It's not an overall, this modification of the guidelines. The proposals, uh, which have been taken on board and are now in the recommendation, have left intact the basic principles, as well as the scope, which applies to, which refers to the public and private sector. And they have left, left intact the key definitions. So there may be work in the future to be continued. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. Uh, in, in, your, in the beginning of your intervention, you mentioned uh, how these um, guidelines have been uh, elaborated, have been worked out. And I think you mentioned the word um, multi-stakeholder process. And uh, Joe was also very kind in his intervention to, to uh, emphasize that the work of the ICCP committee is is multi-stakeholder driven. Um, I'm very happy that you say that because you are one of the, the uh, prominent uh, stakeholders taking part in this multi-stakeholder model. Uh, the reason for um, talking a little bit about this is, as we all know, in particular in the IGF context, multi-stakeholder processes, that is a a very positive word, and I can assure you that we are very well aware in OECD that a very important condition for us to be successful in the work we carry out is that we maintain this multi-stakeholder approach to everything we do. And you will find also in the so-called internet policymaking principles from December 2011, there was a recommendation on the internet policymaking principles that one of the 14 principles is actually about multi-stakeholder driven approaches. And so thank you, Joe, for mentioning this. And I can only echo what you said. I think you were very right in, in uh, underlining that. So Audrey and, and Joe, you. Um, you follow the revision process for, for privacy guidelines. Um, I would like to ask you how you would describe the process. Uh, was it uh, a good process? Was it uh, um, a process which could have been uh, uh, different, better in a different way? And what do you think are the most important takeaways from the, the revision of the guidelines seen from your perspective? And, and Audrey, may I start with you? Thank you. Um, well, I, I want to start by commending Anne and her team for running a really amazing process, multi-year process, difficult, uh, challenging topic among the multi-stakeholder community that participated. So I think I um, uh, mostly have positive things to say about the process and its inclusiveness. Uh, the OECD often works with groups of experts in order to 
gain as much knowledge about the issue as possible. And I think that, as Anne indicated, following the solar ministerial, there was a significant level of interest in uh, updating the guidelines in light of technological development. So uh, I really do commend, commend an excellent process run by the Secretariat. In terms of um, the modifications, I think uh, you know it's really telling, and, and we'll get to the security guidelines in a minute, that the, the basic principles have been um, are so solid that they're still relevant. And uh, it seems like the focus of the discussions over the years, and I think even now that the guidelines have been released, the focus in the future is how to continue to evolve their implementation into the new business models and technological developments that we see online. Uh, so I just want to commend a, a few of the focuses that Anne uh, mentioned. The first on accountability. This has been a, an area that the private sector has been, uh, and Joe, Joe has also been very involved in, and we're looking at in terms of how to make organizations accountable for how personal data is used. And, and the fact that there's a bit more elaboration about that, there was extensive discussion about it in the preparation to releasing the guidelines, I think demonstrates that in the new complicated, more complicated and more rich environment in which data live today, that uh, more burden on the user is not necessarily a reasonable expectation to set, and that uh, expecting the business holding the data to act in a responsible and accountable way in terms of how the data are used is, um, is, is I think, a huge advancement in, in the community's thinking about privacy. Uh, and so, I, you know, the, without, I'm going to take all the time and let Joe talk, but the, um, the other principles, I think, you know, when we think about where we are and rethinking how these apply, I'm pretty confident that this revision of the guidelines I don't know whether it will last 30 more years, but <laughs> I think it's certainly uh, it's put a stake in the ground, you know, in a way that has made it uh, has made them continue to be current in our environment, but also aspirational in the way that they think about how we treat transborder data flows. And just on the topic of the transborder issue, um, because it is such a a, a current issue and one that is playing out in light of current events, um, it's very helpful to recognize that uh, the principles, uh, you know, the principles uh, articulated in the guidelines that if they can be implemented in a way that uh, that is cross-border harmonized, the data can still flow. It's, a, it's it, in my view, at least, it's a win-win situation where you have. Uh, a level of cohesion among policies, but you can still have the data flow across borders because we all need that for um, for the internet and for the technologies that we know and love to operate well. So I commend specifically a focus on on that, given the uh, the challenges in that area that we face. Thank you, and perhaps I'll, I'll do a little more focus on the specific aspects of the process. So um, the process was useful because it was inclusive. It was inclusive across the stakeholders, but it was also geographically inclusive. Uh, the process was taken on the road. Uh, we had various meetings in various places related to, to the guidelines. Uh, there, it's, uh, there were meetings on the margins of the Data Protection Commissioner's meeting in Israel and, and other places, so there were workshops related to that. Uh, there was a, an ability to have input from across non-member economies to the OECD. Uh, so it, it really was a process where we tried to talk about the relevance of the guidelines, uh, the context of the guidelines in today's world. So when you think about the basic principles of the guideline, which Ann mentioned were, weren't really changed, the answer was they weren't changed, but the concepts of how you apply them were. Because the concept of consent, well, the concept hasn't changed dramatically, but the concept of consent on this device, kind of are your device, versus consent on that device, versus consent on something that might be smaller, something that may be your watch, something that may be a tag. Those concepts change in terms of how you apply the idea of consent to those. Uh, we now find ourselves in a world of big data where we start to say, well, maybe consent also has to be in the, base, in the context of a use-based model, so other things that are being explored. But all, all of these issues are things that were considered uh, and then uh, the, the guidelines 
uh, the, the explanatory text of the guidelines was, was also supplemented to actually take into account some of these implementation and application questions uh, that arise in the context of the principles. So I think it, it's been a, a fairly useful process because you know, we talked about consequences, unintended consequences, and I think the draft reflects what's a useful compromise across stakeholders uh, in this process that reflects the realities of today uh, and puts the, the guidelines uh, well positioned uh, to be relevant going on into the future. Thank you, Joe. This was um, a little bit about the background uh, and the takeaways from the process in uh, drafting the, the uh, revised privacy guidelines. And uh, thank you for your comments. Are there anybody who has uh, is there anybody who has questions to the panelists at this stage or comments related to the the privacy guidelines before we move on to the security guidelines? Anybody who have comments questions? Remote participants? No. Well, Everything is clear, yes. <laughs> Thank you for your support. <laughs> um, let's move on then to the security guidelines. Um, I think, uh, Laura, um, everybody agrees that the 2002 security guidelines can be considered a landmark. Um, they are now being reviewed, and uh, the process is not finished yet. But uh, you're heavily engaged in the work. Can you maybe reveal a little bit about what is not secret, but uh, maybe is open to the public? Could you tell us something about what can we expect? I can reveal everything. Nothing is secret. It's a good thing with a multi-stakeholder process. Um, but I don't know what the outcome of that process will be. I cannot reveal that because I don't know. I'm not sure anyone knows. But I can uh, give you some uh, indications of the direction the process is taking and some of the concepts that are being uh, uh, attracting a lot of attention for possible changes in the guidelines. I would say uh, you can expect um, some important new elements in terms of new, completely new recommendations in, in the guidelines, uh, but at, at the same time as well, a mix of um, stability and change regarding the uh, uh, principles that existed in the, uh, in the 2002 guidelines. You've um, highlighted that the security guidelines were a landmark, are a landmark, I think we can, uh, we can talk about a paradigm shift in 2002 when they were adopted. They set the principles for how to address security in an open and interconnected environment. Um, and, and to uh, understand where we are today and where we are heading to, let, let's go back to 1992. The original initial guidelines were adopted uh, in 1992. There are guidelines for the security of information systems. Um, and uh, in 1992, a long time ago, uh, information systems were closed environment. Uh, they were, uh, an, uh, they, they were um, actually expensive to um, make them talk to each other. It was expensive to open the environment, and it was free to keep it closed. Uh, these siloed systems were uh, the way to secure to secure them was about uh, keeping them closed to prevent the threat from outside to get inside. And that was not, compared to now, not too hard because uh, they were closed. Um, that meant at the time that the responsibility for um, uh, protecting the system could be uh, delegated to someone with the responsibility of keeping the systems closed. Uh, but Ten years later, when we revised these guidelines in 2002, the internet was there and in the course of, 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 of being what it is today. Uh, the internet, if you look at it from a, from a security perspective, the internet is 
a, a universe where the systems are interoperable by default. Um, and, and this interoperability by default, this openness by default is driving, as, as uh, the chair mentioned, a huge economic and social benefits. Uh, therefore, the security uh, in that environment has to come from a different mindset, a different concept, because it's not possible anymore to say we are going to have the system secure by keeping them closed. Um, the benefits, uh, the systems have to be open because this openness drives benefits. Um, therefore, what's the alternative model? In 2002, the alternative model for security of information systems and networks um, was identified as being risk management. In other words, the recognition that we are never going to fully secure the system because of openness, because we need that openness. Some risk will inherently be there, but we can reduce the level of risk to a level that is acceptable. Uh, and that means that in terms of responsibility, you cannot delegate to someone the responsibility. Everybody, all participants in that environment share some responsibility for the security. So uh, this paradigm shift in the thinking in 2002 uh, 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 led to uh, nine principles. I'm not going to go through them. Four principles are funda foundational awareness raising. You, you have to be aware of that there is a risk, otherwise not, nothing will happen. We'll have problems. Responsibility, as I just mentioned, ethics and democracy, and, and five principles which relate to risk management. So then are we now um, in, in that, uh, in, with that in mind where this is still true today. We are not in, going in the direction of saying we have to change the, that paradigm again. This is still true. However, we do have serious difficulties, we being actually everybody, have serious difficulties to, to get the mindsets right. This paradigm shift of, of 2002 is far from being understood by everybody, by all participants, from the top to the bottom in all stakeholder groups, um, which, which should be what we need. Uh, for example, when we use the word security alone, or security of information systems and networks, the intuitive meaning is that uh, it is possible to achieve security, full security. Security is binary. You're secure or you're not secure. But in an open world, you're never secured, fully secured. Actually, in life, nothing is ever fully secured. There's always some level of risk. So this is ambiguous, and that's not really the meaning of the guidelines. Um, and it's also ambiguous because, because today, when we talk about security, some may understand national security. And that's not also the context of the guidelines. And when we talk about information systems and networks, it sounds like it's a technical issue. But it's not a technical issue, because the, perhaps at some level, of course, there's technology involved, but the risk faced are economic and social. Um, so all this ambiguity in the terms we have to fix, and this is one key uh, element of change in the uh, revision, uh, current review of the guidelines, making the, the, the principles clearer, more direct, uh, less ambiguous, using terms that uh, remove ambiguity. Uh, now, um, the other big change uh, in this, uh, the other big possible change or anticipated change is the inclusion in the guidelines of principles, uh, recommendations on how to implement these uh, principles, uh, and in particular, how governments should implement these principles through uh, national public policies. In, in 1992, there was a section on uh, uh, government inter implementation, but this was gone in uh, 2002 for, for many reasons. It's probably not mature yet to, to know what governments should do to implement the principles, and today we see that it has changed. We've worked uh, uh, on a comparative analysis of national cyber security strategies a, a couple of years ago, and uh, it showed that we are at a turning point in government uh, policy making in this area, and we, are, we have enough material to, uh, to start thinking about what kind of uh, recommendations could be made to governments. And some of the key concepts, I won't go through all the brainstorming that's going on in, in, in the process of the review, but just some, some, some quick uh, concepts here. The first one is the need for a strategy uh, by governments. Governments should have a strategy uh, for addressing 
um, uh, so I don't know what to say, security of information systems and networks, cyber security, we don't exactly know yet what terms we will use, but something along perhaps security risk, or cyber security risk. Um, then the st a clear strategy and a vision, and we see that these strategies tend to be holistic, uh, comprehensive, addressing all the facets of cyber security, from the uh, uh, economic and social aspects to the legal, the technical aspects, but also uh, aspects related to sovereignty, uh, national security, international stability, intelligence, etc. This is the, this is a strong trend uh, and um, likely to, to to be a point, um, or at least being a strong point in the current discussions. Um, I mean, there are three other uh, interrelated concepts. The first one is multi-stakeholders. We've talked about it in the, process, in the OECD process, but it is an important element of uh, internet governance, as we know in particular here at the, IGA, uh, at the IGS, but how to do that in the context of developing uh, cyber security strategies and implementing cyber security strategies. Uh, it raises some, uh, some, some specific challenges that have to be overcome. A multi-stakeholder process is indispensable in that area too, uh, in particular because the infrastructure is owned and operated by private sector and it's also used by private sector, whether business or individuals, it's also used by government, so a true multi-stakeholder process is, is, is needed. Another key word is cooperation, and, and it's a cooperation across all directions, cooperation from governments to private sector, public-private cooperation, but also, and we tend not to think about that uh, enough, cooperation moving the, crowd, the, the government across the various government silos. Um, it's cooperation inside the private sector across the different firms or across sectors, and it's cooperation um, with um, uh, civil society. It's also cooperation um, at, uh, between the policy makers and the, 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 te the technology um, uh, crowd, and it's also cooperation at national level and at international level. So we really have, it, it's a very strong, uh, it's a very strong concept in, in this review. Uh, another important element is the need for, uh, at, at a national level, for a governance framework. It's not anymore possible to have scattered initiatives across the government. There should be a holistic uh, a national uh, cyber security strategy, but it should create uh, a governance framework where the responsibilities are clearly defined within the government. Uh, another point is metrics, the need for measuring uh, and I won't qualify it, it's across the board. We have very, well, we have metrics, there are metrics in, in this space, but they, they have flaws, one being that they are not comparable internationally, another one being that uh, the robustness may, may not be sufficient for assessing the risk and for feeding uh, both, um, uh, for informing the policy making process, but also for feeding uh, uh, the need for um, uh, understanding the markets uh, and, uh, and, 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 and potential economic developments. Another one is skills. Awareness is a very important thing. It is still there, uh, raising awareness of uh, all stakeholders, but it, it is extended to the notion of skills. There is a serious skills shortage in the area of cyber security. The problem is increasing, but um, there are not enough skilled um, people to address it. That's, a, that's becoming really a front and center in this area. Uh, and another one is uh, they need to uh, have the right frameworks to ensure that uh, the cyber security policies respect fundamental values. And here comes um, uh, notions like transparency and trust in, in the government. So as I said, as you, as you noted, the process is not over, uh, uh, but this is, this, this is the, the direction we aim to have, uh, uh, we, we're just going towards the end of the first step, which is a consultation of experts, a uh, multi-stakeholder consultation of experts, uh, and uh, the intention is to draft revised guidelines over the course of next year and to reach uh, something uh, at the end, perhaps, of next year. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent, for this quick overview tour de force through the work of 
um, the revision of the security guidelines. I now turn to Autry and, and Joe, and uh, I would like to ask you, do you agree that the security guidelines are up for revision? Is it a good idea? I, I take it that you do. And if you can confirm that this is a good idea, what do you consider to be the the most pressing changes to to implement? And, and furthermore, I would also like uh, to uh, hear your views about do you see um, an alignment or a lack of alignment among stakeholders on the revision work and on the points up for revision? Audrey, you're first. Okay. Thank you. So yes, I think there's, I personally, and I think the broader business community has come to a consensus that it's it's timely to review the security guidelines. So I think that the question of whether they should or shouldn't be reviewed is, is largely, uh, I think, been put to bed and, and everyone pretty much agrees it's time. Um, in terms of what, you know, what the big issues are, I mean, Long did a great job of outlining what's already there. And I think, uh, you know, I know Joe and I have spent a long, uh, and, and through the business community and others, a, long time, a lot of time thinking about these guidelines and what role they might play in the future. And so what I see is that security has become the central force in policy making about technology and the internet. And while the, the 1992-2002 guidelines were very instructive and, and to some degree ahead of their time. Um, I would argue, at the risk of being a bit uh, controversial, that perhaps they haven't had as great of an impact on influencing the government policy environment as the privacy guidelines have, uh, in the sense that I think that they uh, have been extremely important and they've been relevant, but it's been a little bit harder to translate them into the variety of, of policy issues that cross the security realm. And I think that's even um, more apparent today with some of the national security contexts and uh, uh, that, that we see. And so while these are all very relevant principles and, and I think it's hard to argue against any of them, uh, to me the question has always been how can we refine them further and add to them so that they are more applicable to the policy struggles that governments are actually undertaking. And I, and I know from, from spending time with the Secretary that, that that's also their intent. And, and what do they mean in this environment? So um, they, you know, and, and so I think there's a few concepts from a business perspective that I see governments struggling with when they make policy around security that are not necessarily reflected here that um, that I think it should be part of the discussion as, and has been, I should say. Um, the, the Secretariat held a meeting uh, in April uh, where the experts group convened. We held a meeting in conjunction with APAC a few weeks ago in Honolulu, and we've had, so we've had great discussions about this. Um, a few of the, the topics that I would, I would um, highlight uh, is specifically the role of economic and societal values in in security policies, there's often this desire to focus so much on security that we forget the broader context in which technology operates. And I know that it's an area that the OECD is particularly well placed to uh, provide guidance to governments on how to think about those issues, how to quantify them, how to make trade-offs in policy making. The other one um, is standards and the role of technical standards and global standards in policy making. Um, many of the security policies that are being developed are very reliant on the standards environment to demonstrate uh, the security robustness of something. And we see, I said this on the last panel, so I said on this panel too, be consistent, um, that the standards environment is um, at risk of breaking apart, at least the global standards environment, because governments uh, want to, kind of, from a security perspective, hold on to their own piece of the pie. And so um, principles around cooperation in the standardization process, relying on global standards, are very important to industry. And I think there's concepts like that that we, uh, we are discussing and we hope that can be infused in the next revision of the guidelines. Um, and then to your question of what are the more, the, the third question, I think the biggest um, challenge in the context of the experts group that keeps getting raised is, you know, how do we divide up the world of national security issues from the world of economic security issues so that we can, you know, focus on um, 
economic and societal values issues as, without um, trying to make principles around national security. And it's an area that we, if a girl would say, it, it, it continues to come up in conversation. It's a struggle. It's a struggle outside the context of the guideline review. It's, I think, a struggle in almost every country that's working on, on security policy, which is pretty much every country. So um, I think that will continue to be a challenge in, 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 in the current context. But I'm very hopeful and confident in the fact that the OECD has taken this up because of their deep expertise in looking at economic and societal values. And so I'm hoping we can advance, advance those goals. Thank you. As, as Laurent took us through the history of the guidelines from 1992, which in technical and internet terms is uh, uh, some, somewhere in the glacial before time, um, the, uh, we, we look at what was a document written for systems going to a document that's written for systems and networks uh, to really a document, and I'm using this word because my colleagues at the OEC would be disappointed if I didn't use this word, uh, a document going to ecosystems. Um, uh, and so realistically, and, and the ecosystem means you're also thinking of privacy and security. It's a holistic way forward of thinking of all of these issues because they're all moving parts. Uh, and if you hold only one moving part, you forget about the effect you're having on all the other moving parts. So it, it has to be something where you're thinking of it. You're also thinking in a more global dimension than you ever have before. So the fact that there's an exploit in a country that is 13 hours displaced from you means that if you can get information about that exploit, you may be able to prevent it from becoming a harm to your system. And that's where some of the concepts of how information sharing works can be tremendously useful. Because we see these exploits cruising across the globe. Uh, you know, sometimes they hit all at once in many places, but sometimes they also go kind of as a wave. And the more you can sh share information, the better that is, especially when you, when you come to the context of now having zero day exploits, where you don't have really any catch up time related to these exploits. So we're, we're looking at an area that has changed. And it doesn't mean that the principles of the previous set of guidelines don't hold anymore. What it means is they need to be supplemented with other concepts that weren't addressed in the first set of principles. Uh, the concept of each according to his own, his or her or its own role is still a very valid and appropriate context. And in fact, I raised it uh, at the high level meeting that was held just before the IGF uh, because it was completely relevant to their discussion of what a culture of security might be. And in fact, the OECD guidelines I won't say it was the first to use that, but it certainly popularized the concept uh, of the culture of security uh, in the context of needing to be aware and each person needing to take a role in the concept of security. So I, I think we're at a point where um, we do have a concept that they are ripe for review and ripe for, for supplementing. Uh, the issues are pressing. They are more global. Uh, they are across all stakeholders because security is an issue whether you have a small phone, whether you have a laptop, whether you still have a desktop, whatever your device is, security is an issue and there is a role. Uh, it's a systems issue. It's a network issue. It's a supply chain issue. Uh, it's a value chain issue. It's a governmental issue. It's a societal issue. All of these are now coming to the fore. And different stakeholder groups bring different issues into the mix. And the guidelines are written at a level where each of those stakeholder groups can take something away from them. Some of the principles or some of the explanations related to the principles may be more directed to one stakeholder group than another. Uh, but the principles have a broad applicability, which makes them very useful in this time when all of us need to consider concepts of security. Um, so it's something I can commend to people to look for. Uh, and, and try to look at, uh, I think on a number of issues, there, there is an alignment across the stakeholder groups. Uh, you want to create and maintain independent autonomy, yet you want to have transparency. You want to enable security. Uh, I think the points where Audrey highlighted uh, concepts of conflict are places where it's a question of people draw the line in different places. We also have to consider, uh, in terms of the OECD, what is its basic competence and role, which usually isn't in national security policy making, so that's not usually the remit 
uh, of OECD, which is one of the reasons why it focuses significantly more on economic security. Um, but again, these are these are the concepts that are always discussed, especially uh, when you go across stakeholders. Um, and it's a very useful discussion that helps inform the guidelines going forward. Thank you very much, uh, Orkri and Joe. I, I now turn to the, the audience I would like to ask. Uh, are there any questions or comments on the background of these last interventions? Yes, there is a question behind. Who's managing the microphone? Please say your name and where you come from. Hello. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Buckridge from the RIPE NCC. Um, I also work um, with ITAC, and I'm, I'm in the CISP working party particularly. Um, one of the things that's been interesting for us, or that we've been trying to engage with a little bit in recent months, is the European Commission's proposal on NIS um, re uh, directive. Uh, and given that there are many EU member states, are also members of the OECD, I was wondering if not, not to sort of call you out to make any specific comments, I guess, but if, if there was any comment on the relationship you see between, I guess, there's obviously the timeliness that this review is happening at the same time that that's happening in the European Commission, but also whether there was any relationship that you can see or comment on between the guidelines as they exist and how the process or how the regulation has been drawn up in the European Commission instance. Thank you very much. Who will comment on this? I can make the general comment that the level at which uh, the guidelines are um, written or will be written um, is different from the level of the um, directive, which has uh, much more detail and is aimed at um, uh, creating legal uh, obligations, laws, legislation. The guidelines is a policy instrument some aspects in there may lead to legislation, but the flexibility um, uh, of, of the uh, drafting level, implied by the drafting level, can uh, enable each uh, country or region or the EU to implement it in a way that may or may not be uh, uh, legislation. Um, now, and in addition to that, many aspects of the guidelines address points which are uh, which don't go in the direction of having legislation. Uh, so, so that's the main difference. Now, I would say, having read the directive, the draft um, the proposal for a directive, I would not see strong inconsistency. Fortunately for us, since we have many OECD members who are. Uh, in the uh, European Union, um, but we are not. Uh, we, uh, that's it. So Laurent is comfortable. Are there are there other comments or or yeah. <laughs> So, but, um, so there, are, there are elements I would say of the directive that. Um, certainly embody existing OECD principles like response and awareness. So the, the elements of the directive that, you know, are trying to raise the level of response capability across EU member states and so it calls for the creation and development of CERT capabilities and so you could think of that as falling under the guideline of response um, today. I think there are other elements of the directive, and they're not like tied together in any way, like officially. I think if you looked across the world and the number of countries that are writing cybersecurity policies and strategies, you would not be surprised. I mean, you would you'd come up with a, I don't have a number I should, but it's everywhere, right? So from that point of view, it's just sort of maybe a happy coincidence or a sign of the times or whatever. But the um, the other OECD instrument that is also, I think, uh, overlapping uh, with what the directive is trying to do is the recommendation on critical information infrastructure protection from 2008. 
I got that right. And um, and so the other half of what the directive is doing is trying to define critical infrastructure protection across the EU, and that's I think proposed. That's created a whole another set of challenges and difficulties where you see parts of the directive that are maybe less difficult to define, at least if you're not a member state, and then there are other areas that are more challenging uh, to define. But the CIIP directive that, that the OECD did um, tries to, I think we actually drew on it a lot in our, in, at least in my conversations in Brussels the last year or two, on it has leveraged the work of that um, recommendation to try to help define the scope of what the Commission is trying to do within the scope of critical infrastructure protection. So I think it's informative. Um, in the future, there could be ele there are elements in the directive and in the communication that I think uh, would be instructive for the guidelines in the future. And I go back to my comment about standards earlier because there's a focus on standardization in the directive and you know having some broader guidelines on how governments should develop standards might help inform this kind of a legislative instrument in the future. Sorry. I guess the one thing I would also add is the Commission is actually also an observer uh, at the OECD, so they are not actually surprised uh, by what is in the guidelines, and they are more than able to articulate themselves when they think there's something they need to add or, or wish to suggest. Um, so that's always useful. And I, and I since we're talking about security, I must commend the people who have secured the water uh, because they have done an amazing job. Yeah, <laughs> I share the same experience, too. <laughs> yes, and coming back to the, uh, the um, interrelation between OECD and the European Union, as, as Joe Reiki pointed out, so the European Commission is actually present at the ICCP meetings, and uh, in particular, when we talked about the OECD privacy guidelines, they were extremely active and uh, so it, there's a, a very good uh, interrelationship between what is going on in the EU and in, in the OECD. Are there other questions, comments at this stage? One in the back, please. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I'm Linda Kassinskati with the book from UNESCO. Uh, very interesting discussion, very interesting presentation, so thank you. Uh, um, I have a question which you know, I would like to have qualification. You spoke about culture of security. What does this exactly you mean? Is it really like um, electric behavior on cyberspace? This is what you need? Or it's much more behind? So it was term used culture and security culture. I think that is exactly right. Yeah. Just, just before I give the microphone to Laura, I used in the past to work first line on privacy and security, and, and I worked um, on the 2002 security guidelines as well as on the guidelines for the protection of critical information infrastructures. I have to say that. Um, the culture of security. You said, Joe, you don't know who invented it, but um, what was his first name? Oh, no, 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 that's not a US created term. I'm sorry, it's Australian. Peter Ford. I'm sorry, it's Australia this time. <laughs> I don't think it would be the one. Yeah, well, anyway, there's a dispute going on. <laughs> um, the culture of security was, in fact, something that tried to explain that each of us in our different capacities as citizens, as working in organizations, in government, and so on, should begin to think of security as in a routine manner. And one of the examples that was given by them to try to pass on the message was when you enter a plane, you are asked to switch off your cell phone and other devices. Although that may change in the future, by the way. But, and, and that was the goal, that people become aware that it's a, it's a chain, an end-to-end -end chain, and when you're not secure, you may just put in danger others because of this relation. But, uh -huh. so, sorry, Anne, for taking away, because I, I want to, uh, Laurent to comment on the question, but also maybe to, to comment on what happened at the Seoul Cyberspace Conference, 
where there was um, a discussion about the need for establishing international norms of behavior. Maybe you could take that and include that in your answer. Yeah, I, I think it's related, I will add to the origins of the, I was not born in 2002, so I don't know <laughs> what the origin is. The concept of culture is seen, I think, by most of the experts that we are talking with, to, or talking to as essential, still valid today. The, uh, so we could use other words, like mindset, uh, state of mind, whatever, but the idea that we should all share the same concepts regarding how we address security is very important. Now, what has changed today is that the term security is more misleading than it was in 2002. And when we say culture of security, it could mean many different things to many different people, and probably not for many of them what was the intention in 2002. Uh, that goes back to the question of uh, uh, security versus risk. What we are really aiming to is managing risk and through a number of security measures. But security is not the goal. Management of the risk is the goal, and we manage the risk to maximize the, uh, to reduce the uncertainty in order to increase the likelihood of economic and social success. That's the full uh, thinking. Um, but that leads to your question on, on norms of behavior, because actually, when we look, and that's the personal brainstorming, they are not yet at the stage where it's, uh, there is anything agreed. So, But actually, when you look at the principles, and uh, even some of the potent possible recommendations to government, there is a lot that has to do with behavior. How you approach all of, the, all of this. Being responsible, well, you can have that in law, but before having that in law, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a culture, it's a state of being, it's a behavior, feeling responsible. And spreading that across all participants, again, and law can help, but it's not the starting point. Uh, um, so perhaps one idea and the concept of norms of, or international norms of behavior in cyberspace, which is uh, very much in the debate of the London Data Perso conferences, and that we hear elsewhere in other contexts as well, um, it, it is used uh, probably with different facets, but with respect to the economic and social facet, uh, what would be these norms of behavior? Perhaps we have uh, in the guidelines or in the future guidelines some of these flexible, high-level uh, norms uh, that reflect that, that will hopefully reflect a consensus across all stakeholders, uh, and uh, that could represent part of these international norms of behavior that uh, has been uh, discussed. I, just, I would like just to take that opportunity to highlight uh, one more thing, because the SOAR conference is related to the international debate, and I, I forgot to mention that the international uh, aspects are also essential, uh, an essential driver in the review and revision of the guidelines, that's another dimension which was not men mentioned. Um, we could um, uh, we see a capacity building as an as an essential concept, which should be somewhere. It's becoming really uh, important because uh, all uh, it's a global issue, and perhaps there should be a minimum level in uh, all countries to address uh, cyber risks. Uh, um, but we could, look, we could look at all the principles of the guidelines and, and try to imagine what they mean in an international context. And what would that mean for international cooperation? Take, for example, the responsibility principle. What would that mean at the scale of a country uh, if you bring it at an international level? We could look at the democracy principle. We could look at awareness. We could look at all the risk management principles and see what do they mean to address the international dimension of this problem. We talk about governments having national strategies and uh, a governance framework domestically, but how does that work internationally? Perhaps they should take the advantage of having a holistic approach and a core, if, if, they manage, if they succeed in having a coordination process across the agencies and ministry to make that coordination point an international point of contact to facilitate international cooperation. So these are the kind of kind of ideas that could more concretely uh, uh, fit the uh, new guidelines. 
Thank you very much, uh, Laurent. This, this discussion about uh, norms and behavior reminds me uh, about other sectors where norms and behavior are discussed and where, where you could draw a parallel line to this sector. My wife is a medical doctor. She's a surgeon. And uh, she always told me that one of the first lessons she learned in university was always wash your hands between patients. And I think that this uh, norm for behavior could be uh, um, rephrased also within this area. But Joe, you have the floor. Well, it, it goes along the lines of exactly to your story because uh, I remembered a different example than Anne remembered. Um, and the example I remembered was um, look both ways before you cross the street. And the concept was it kind of became innate knowledge. It really wasn't something you had to be tremendously schooled in. And the concept was how do we get security to be that concept, whether it's an organization that's securing a system, whether it's a person that's updating their virus protection, what have you, how do you have that reflexive almost behavior of look both ways before you cross the street? Uh, that being said, I will also say that Laurent said there really wasn't any misunderstanding of culture of security at the time. I, that's a little not, not true. Because you weren't born yet in 2002, I'll forgive you for that. Um, he's amazingly well preserved for his age. Um, the, uh, the concept was that there was a general understanding of the culture of security, but there was a little discomfort that somehow the culture of security might be read by some to have an implication of big brother, but I can assure you that was not the implication that was meant by the culture of security. It was that kind of how do we get security to be ingrained uh, in the culture of those on the internet so that it's a reflexive concept as opposed to someone something you have to be told to do, it becomes your natural course of behavior. Thank you very much, Joe. There, I think there was another question behind, please. Microphone. Thank you, thank you, Chair. My name is Xie Hong from UNESCO as well. Um, I, if I understood correctly, I, I hear you uh, mentioned that the OECD uh, Internet Policy Making Principles. Uh, and this is really what I'm interested in. I think I've been in contact with you on that. Uh, you know, UNESCO is also uh, exploring a sort of uh, a holistic uh, conceptual framework. Uh, we call it the uh, Internet Universality. We are presenting tomorrow morning. Uh, talked about the fundamental norms and the values of Internet governance being human rights based, openness, accessible by all, and uh, multi stakeholderism. And I want to know about the uh, OECD uh, Internet Policy Making Principle. How is the implementation situation? Uh, how is it, uh, has it been uh, followed in your member states? And uh, what, uh, have you encountered any challenges? And uh, is there already any good practices to share? As, uh, that's, that's the first question. Second one that uh, I'm also impressed that uh, OECD has done quite uh, extensive work on intermediaries uh, uh, role and guidelines. Could you also share more uh, in this regard? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for this very good question, which is a very broad question, but a very relevant one. Uh, you're correct that we, we have, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, uh, adopted a set of internet policy making principles, uh, 14 principles which have been um, uh, adopted in the OECD Council, meaning that all 34 countries member of OECD are behind the, the uh, principles. Also an additional number, I think three other countries have um, endorsed the, the principles. I forgot right now the names of the countries, but but, but maybe I could ask um, Anne Cablan to elaborate a little bit further on, on this issue. Anne? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, for the countries with, uh, which have um, endorsed the internet policy making principles, we have um, Latvia, Costa Rica, Colombia, and I think Lithuania. So it's. Um, it's in good progress. So the first question was um, to, to make a parallel between the internet policy making principles and the work, uh, the current work you, you are 
doing and will present tomorrow. Um, and Egypt. Thank you. Egypt also endorsed. Sorry. <laughs> Did I forget something? No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <coughs> absolutely. You can find them on, on the internet, either in the rubric legal instruments of the OECD or on our web pages, which are dedicated. So um, we're talking about implementation. So it's a very really recent instrument. It's been adopted by Council end of December 2011. And um, usually we have a cycle of three to five years before we review the implementation because they are so high level. Nevertheless, we have a working uh, group of, um, of member governments, but not only member governments, other, uh, other countries and uh, private sector, civil society and internet technical community, which has started um, a few months ago to, to look at and to discuss areas where the implementation could be, um, could be let's say, facilitated. Because what I need to, to say of, um, about these principles is, first of all, they build on very different instruments that have been produced in this area. There is a reference to, to security, there is a reference to privacy, there is a reference to broadband, in, to consumer policy, to uh, enforcement. In all those areas, we have instruments. So, in fact, it's a, you could say it's a compilation of best practices. It's a, it's a compilation of work, policy work already done in other areas. In addition to that, to reflecting this experience, it has new principles which are not only reaffirming but calling for maintaining the openness of the internet. <coughs> Sorry. A call for transparency and um, fair process, due process, um, which we didn't have specifically up to now. And it has also um, a reference to. Um, Multi-stakeholderism, um, sorry. Multi-stakeholder approach. I'm tired. <laughs> so um, in terms of implementation, it's a bit early, but we have started. And what we want to do, in fact, is demonstrate, um, if possible, with evidence, meaning data, that if you do policy making in a coherent way, it is good for the economy, it is good for the society. So it is a practical implementation with economic evidence that we are looking for. Just to give you an example of the last point made by Anne Cablan, um, we, we have seen some example of countries which have not applied the principle of an open internet, um, where, where you see dramatic negative consequences of, for example, imposing a tax on internet traffic. There are some countries in, in Africa who has uh, used this means of getting an, uh, a high yield in their um, government budget or supporting the government budget, and we have seen that immediately after the imposition of such a tax, uh, you see a dramatic decrease of traffic to the disadvantage of the growth of the economy. So this is just one example of uh, why it is important to, to apply the principle of an open internet in that country. So, and, and we'll try to uh, provide uh, similar examples regarding the other 14 or the other 13 principles. So, Joe? Yeah, I just wanted to give another example. If you think about um, and it also applies to the concept of security norms, which was part of the discussion before. Because if you think about if every country says, well, you know, I'm going to localize data to my country, and every country says I'm going to have a different set of security standards, you've essentially broken any concept of end-to-end -end anything. You don't have global information flows. You don't actually have the ability to, de to deploy a, a global system. And, and we're looking at a more globalized world than ever before. We have to think about how to be responsible across global systems, and that's a very important part of what the dialogue of IGF brings to the table. But we have to recognize that those systems have to exist in order for actually 
allowing how the internet works, how business works, how social interaction works, because it's not limited to you and your neighbor. It's now a global family that's having a conversation, that's doing business, uh, that's having societal dialogue. So it, it's important when we keep these things to also think about how to avoid the fragmentation of the internet, which is something that uh, is a topic that comes up that everyone seems to be against correctly. Thank you very much, Joe. I, I look at my watch and I see that we are we are exceeding the time slot allocated for this open forum slightly. But um, you, when you act as a moderator in a session like this, you have a challenge how to finalize the session in a, a an appropriate manner. And I decided to try to finalize this session by asking the panel one last question. And this last question, I don't know whether the panelists are actually um, able to or willing to answer this particular question, but I would like to ask the question, having now the revised uh, privacy guidelines on the table, it's here, and having the security guidelines in process, the revision of the security guidelines in process, what do you consider to be the most prominent challenge we are facing in the next coming two, three, four, five years. If you should pick one particular challenge, don't feel obliged to answer the question. It's a very comprehensive question, and I know that in particular ladies want to get back to their hotel rooms and, and uh, change to the gala dinner dress, but uh, if we could make just a quick to the top among the panelists on, on this question. Uh, would you agree, Joe? Joe? Um, I, I think you know, one, of the, one of the largest and most difficult concepts to come to grips with, whether it's privacy or security, is how to apply principles in context. Uh, that's been a challenge throughout the whole time, and I think the fact that we're going to more risk-based analysis helps it apply in context more easily uh, I think that we're thinking about how they work with a lot of other moving parts, helps it apply. So I think the the application of the, because these one-size-fits-all solutions really don't, don't work, but the concept is the principles were written at the correct level so that they're flexible in application and can actually be applied in context. Uh, the challenge is for member states as they may move those principles into regulatory environments to also make the regulation applicable in context. And I'll apologize for having to leave quickly. No problem. Um, so I think at, at the highest level, I think the biggest challenge is trust going forward and overcoming barriers to trust that have been built up over time. And um, certainly those challenges will impact the ability to, to both continue to revise the security guidelines and implement them in the context that Joe was just talking about. And so I think that takes real power on the part of the private sector, governments, the intergovernmental community, um, NGOs, you know, the entire multi-stakeholder community to try to uh, advance past uh, some of the issues that we see and rebuild trust. Thank you, Audrey. M. Thank you. Um, I, I fully concur with it. Trust is really the issue. And to be a little bit more specific with respect to, to privacy, we, we are currently working on um, big data, use of data analytics. And um, there are many benefits that can be derived from the use of these techniques, thinking of in the area of health, of uh, how to prevent Alzheimer, um, to you know, benefits in the environment, transportation research, and science in more general. But there are also concerns um, of privacy, and these concerns need to be addressed. And it's not easy, but it's absolutely necessary to find ways to do that so that our societies raise honest the benefits of of the evolution of technologies in this area. Yeah, I, I really think trust is, is really uh, the key word that we should uh, keep in mind for the coming years. Uh, uh, perhaps to highlight one particular area in security that, that we face a challenge that's going to be with us. Uh, I would say the notion that um, 
governments have to manage two facets that are not necessarily always fully aligned, the, the uh, protection, uh, the fostering economic and social development, at the same time protecting national security, and how to do that uh, without one harming the other is a, is a big challenge. Uh, uh, but I don't want just to highlight governments here in, in, in that context. I think the, we, we hear more and more um, the idea that business could, when they are attacked, who, by whoever, could retaliate. We hear the concept of active defense used by governments to do a number of things. Actually, some businesses are offering services to retaliate, when, uh, to actually address attacks, but also strike back in order to give a lesson to the attacker. And that's, I think, a serious challenge that has economic and social consequences in terms of increasing the overall level of risk. And I'm thinking here, again, of both the government and uh, behaviors also in the private sector that, that are challenging, not easy to, to address. Thank, thank you very much. There seems to be agreement about the importance of trust, and I can only echo that myself. And I'm, I might add that trust and transparency as a means to established trust is very, very important for in, in, in this area. I want to thank the dream team uh, around me, Joe, who has left, but I also want to thank my dream audience who at this late stage of the day have, have uh, been true to us and have stayed in the room and uh, you have had a long day. You deserve to to have a nice dinner tonight, and, and I want to uh, close this session by wishing you a nice gala dinner, nice IGF gala dinner. Thank you for coming, attending the OECD Open Forum. Thank you.